This meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Hey, Kai, welcome. My name is Kevin Murray and I'm speaking to you from Nam, Melbourne, the land of the Wurundjeri people, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to the ancestors of the lands where, where you come from. And just to get a sense of where we are coming from, uh, particularly in terms of the uh, the speakers today, if we can just go around and let's know where you are. Gary, where are you? Hi, I'm Gary Warnell. Um, I'm currently in Finland. I'll be leaving back to my second home in Nepal on Saturday. Terrific. And Yudhava Singh, where are you? Namaste. Namaste to everybody. I'm from India, the land of uh, handcrafted textiles and very rich with uh, uh, handmade textiles uh, from many years. And yes. uh, I will be traveling to Malaysia tomorrow for an amazing symposium. Kevin knows about it. It's eighth Asian textile, traditional textile symposium. So you're in Amdabad? I'm in Ahmedabad today. Uh, at Wonderful. four o'clock, I will be catching a flight. With Ahmedabad. And Pamela, Maylene, Nihal. Nihal, I, uh, I'm um, speaking from Mianjin, which is Brisbane in Australia. Terrific. And uh, Thank Patrick, you. certainly the far, most far flung in terms of time today. Where were you speaking from? Um, Greenville, North Carolina, and um, I'm originally from Jamaica, West Indies. I see. Well, terrific. And Greg, prior? Master Greg? Was that passion? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm speaking from Borloo, Perth, Western Australia. Terrific. Welcome. And Sarah, Lindsay? Uh, I'm live in Melbourne, but I'm currently in a small town called Wambara on the coast out down from Sydney and it's Darawal country. Welcome. And uh, Anna Petitas, where were you? Hello. <laughs> yeah, I'm speaking from Wadawurrung and Jajawurrung country in country Victoria. Um, so the regional city of Ballarat. Welcome. Hello. And Alison. Alison McKay, greetings. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm same as Pamela. I'm speaking from Mianjin, um, Brisbane, Australia, but I'm actually on holidays at the Sunshine Coast at the moment, so I hope my Wi-Fi holds out. We'll see how I go. Sounds good. And um, <laughs> hello again. Where are you? Hi, Nanu from Bangkok, born and raised. Terrific. Look forward to hearing from you. Patty. Uh, I'm, I'm here in Wadarung country, um, in Anglesey, in, on the surf coast in Victoria. Right, a few coastal participants today. And Miranda, hello, where are you speaking hello. from? Hello, um, I'm also in Mianjin, Brisbane, on Yagar and Turrbal country. Right, quite a few Mianjin participants today, that's terrific. And Julie? I'm here in Gadigal country in Sydney. Welcome. Okay, and uh, welcome to, to Kay, Sharon, Mel, Tessa. Tessa again, two Tessas. And uh, Songul, you're with us in Turkey. We may hear from Songul again later. So uh, this is a, the launch for the 28th issue of Garland, which is titled Know How, know how The Grammar of Making. And it's part of a, a series of issues in the second journey of Garland, which deal with the, the binaries that define our world, such as between East and West, future and past, and so on. This one looks at the binary of making, how we join and cut and what that means in terms of how we make sense of the world. And I want to particularly acknowledge the pathfinders who've helped us develop the concept for this issue, 
inspired very much by the writing of Tim Ingold and his understanding of blocks and lines and so on as a way of ordering the world. But also beyond that, uh, further back in time, the writing of Tyson Yankaporta, his sand talk, how indigenous thinking can save the world, uh, introduced the idea of carving in particular as a form of writing and the way in which objects can provide a means of thinking through concepts. And that book in particular has been such an important influence in Garland. Anyway, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sarah Lindsay, who is the, the thinker maker. Tyson, of course, was the first thinker maker, but Sarah was the thinker maker for this issue and her story documents very well uh, the projects, the amazing projects, which uh, have a, a sensibility of a weaver in them. So I'll just share the screen, Sarah, and uh, get your story up there. I'll just go up the screen. And uh, please tell us about your contribution to this particular issue and this photograph. Uh -huh. um, well, Kevin, when Kevin asked me to contribute to this issue, he, he suggested that I, I treated it as a residency. So I, be, I was wondering how in fact that I would do that. So what I ended up doing was sort of allocating about a month or six weeks to uh, look into a, a range of projects that I'd um, undertaken uh, over the last two or three, actually probably four years. And I began with this, um, uh, this image because it was a, a image that started off a four year project, which very much started after I'd had issues with my back and was told rather sternly by a surgeon that I was no longer allowed to weave, uh, draw, sit for too long, garden, all the things that I absolutely loved doing and that was a sort of um, crux of my life. So I started going out with my camera. Um, this is all notated in my story um, and was dissatisfied, dissatisfied, dissatisfied until I came across uh, this image of uh, this man um, who I've recently found out is named Craig. Um, and his daughter, and this prompted me to then um, start a four-year project where I was recording uh, skirts, basically, in the streets of Melbourne, um, Kyoto, uh, some in Tokyo, and Portugal. So over the last few years before um, COVID, I spent a considerable amount of time, because I'm at, at my stage of my life where I'm able to now, um, in Portugal, uh, undertaking a residency with an extraordinary organization which uh, uh, pays homage to and celebrates the power of um, the elderly. Although I'm a loath to use that word, the elderly, because I'm considerably older than their bottom line of the demographic <laughs> that they're um, encompassing. Uh, I also have spent a lot of time in Kyoto and studied there in the 1980s. Uh, so this became a really strong focal point for me and gave me a sort of agency, uh, both as, a, as an, an older woman, but it also um, introduced the idea of what you can do and not what you can't do in life. So I, um, this was the first project I've reported on and I decided to divide the article into basically seven sections. So I've got three on projects that I have called solitary projects, which includes this one because I had to be on my own to concentrate. Uh, the second then community-based projects. And uh, today I'm wearing um, a scarf and a group of people, lovely people that I'm staying with, and I have just been for a, a walk uh, to celebrate the around the world. So it was a project that has gone global, 
uh, not quite viral, but certainly global, where I made a series of uniforms and then a hundred scarves that were distributed around the world. This all took place during COVID, COVID and asked people to record their sewing of the text, which is thank you nurses of the world, COVID-19 walking for nurses. And it was a way of bringing people together and feeling that we were uh, working as a, as a group. We were making contact with people all over the world in a way that we weren't able to um, physically. Uh, I think the next image went to um, this series of tapestries that I began in uh, Kyoto in 2019. And they were the first tapestries I'd woven for some years. So again, what you can do, not what you can't do. And I started working very, very small. And um, I have an exhibition on in Sydney, which is why I'm in this part of the world. And I have seven uh, small tapestries that are on display. And um, I think it's really set the path for me now to just keep working on small work that is still has plenty of presence in a wider context. Uh, in three weeks, I'm going back to Portugal to continue this Ginkgo project that I um, had to leave because of illness in the family and then because of COVID, but I'm going back to complete. And at the moment, um, there's another show on in, there's a show on in Melbourne, uh, that reflects this extraordinary work of a group of um, refugees from Myanmar or Burma that I've been working with for nearly nine and a half, ten years. I taught them how to weave tapestries and they've just run with it, having come from a background of fine uh, cloth weaving that they wear um, still in Australia's traditional costume. Um, and it's been the most extraordinary way of feeling like I've contributed to a community, but they have given me back so much. And the uh, tapestries are just out of this world and a wonderful contrast to my very quiet meditative work. These work are wild and I think really re reflect the sort of joyous freedom, um, which of course is not without uh, sadness and loss, but that these extraordinary people have found um, in their new life in Australia. I also use this project as a way of, um, perhaps I won't describe every project, otherwise we'll run out of time, but I did use this uh, project as a way of reflecting on my work, my work as a weaver, what has meant to me, uh, how I'm still doing it, what, what are the aspects of it that I found so endearing and compelling, and that uh, appears in the last section, which I've um, titled Reflection. Uh, but I think in the end, everything is um, connected through this uh, line of thread. My current exhibition is called Drawing the Line. Uh, I have only recently discovered Tim in gold, so of course I found that enormously inspiring. And um, I think the great thing about the sort of line, it has no, it has a beginning, but it has no end. And I'm hoping that's a metaphor for me just to keep working um, in this next stage of my life. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Sarah. And I think What's fascinating about your article, one of the many things is that uh, even though you are a weaver, you know, most of the article is about activities that go beyond the loom, that are about uh, yeah. both in solitary, the kind of patient's attention that you have to the world, which seems related to the act of weaving, and then in community, how to actually connect people together. And uh, so those aspects seem quite strong, but I just, wondered if you could say something very briefly about uh, the person you've chosen to dedicate this issue uh, to uh, um, Lenore yeah. Tawney. Lenore Tawney. Uh, yes, she's uh, an extraordinary uh, artist weaver. And um, I've known about her work since the early 70s when I first started working as a weaver. 
And she is cited as she was a great friend, a great friend of Agnes Martin, the, the minimalist painter who has influenced me enormously over the years. And she is cited as one of the first uh, artists, visual artists, contemporary artists of the time, to take the um, thread, the warp off the loom and suspend it in space. So she created um, these really beautiful minimal um, sculptures from thread and then made these extraordinary collages. And in 1997, I think it was, I was um, extraordinarily privileged to be able to go and visit her in her studio in New York. Um, she was then well into her 90s. She was blind. She had bright red hair. The studio was had bird um, a sound in sort of playing in the in the rafters and there was a mass of young women uh, collating her work and it really was one of those experiences that uh, one has that then you list as one of the great experiences of your life. Mm -hmm. So it's really wonderful that she is certainly like many artists who were working in the 60s and 70s and then got sort of put in the cupboard a bit um, it's been really celebrated for the extraordinary work that she did. She's just had two exhibitions um, at Alison Jack's Gallery in London, and she has had um, quite a bit of work in the Tate Modem, and she had some of her work in the Annie Albers show. So I think she's a highly significant um, artist who contributed an enormous amount to textiles and particularly weaving. Well, thanks for sharing that that vivid memory with us, Sarah. And uh, I believe you're, you're staying with uh, Catherine Bird and Ross Gibson, who were also thinker makers for our Japan issue. So please send them That's our very nice. warm regards as you carry nice on search. that line. If we could now go Thank to you. Patty Behrens. Uh, if you'd like to speak to, to, to your contribution, which is uh, one of the surprising aspects of the issue was weaving in clay and your work is very much about that. So tell us briefly about uh, this story and the, the event it relates to. So um, I think when I first spoke with you, Kevin, I was going to write a story about um, lawn because uh, I had done a work as part of their biennale but then when the deadline came up I was in Alice Springs and I was so in so engrossed in this work I just I felt this was the work to actually write about even though I didn't know about it when I first spoke with you. Um, in my work generally um, I have uh, been inspired by Tim Ingold quite a lot generally because I find he's quite he gives quite practical ideas of how we can live in the world a bit differently. And I always use his concept of uh, trying to work with the world rather than doing two. That sort of resonates with me. And so in this particular um, uh, story, I was in uh, Mumbatwe, Alice Springs, um, and it was part of the Ceramics Triennale. And they had a really quite an open invitation to me to do to allow my work to develop when I was there. So I didn't uh, have to, didn't have to take a, any particular form, which was really uh, quite generous of them. I arrived a few weeks earlier. The whole work took about 15 days. Um, and uh, the idea is to sort of come to the place, which is what I did there, and then just sort of to use the weaving as a way of having a conversation with the place and the people and what I hear, and then to allow it to respond. It was collaboratively collaborative. In fact, I met a lady when I worked, there's a craft center there. I met a lady when I walked in there uh, who said she wanted to help. So that was great. She was a constant helper. Um, but then people who were coming to the conference sort of stepped in and did some weaving at times and other times just chatted. The whole idea is that the visitors are actually part of the weaving. The conversation is part of the weaving. Um, I found it actually quite difficult. Um, it's 
I don't know who's been to Alice Springs recently, but um, the conflict with the traditional owners or the tension is quite um, evident um, and the surveillance, particularly post COVID. So actually I found it because I think there was a sense that they wanted a romantic work. Um, so initially I found the work quite difficult. Um, uh, the, the first thing I was told when I was, when I was sort of shown the space that I was able to work was everything gets vandalized at night. So I sort of said, well, that doesn't matter. Um, we just take, you know, my work is you respond to the place and the people in the place. If they vandalize it, they vandalize it. It will ad adapt. Weaving is quite good like that. And clay, quite incredible. Um, but then one of the more moving stories is we had the opening and the traditional owner uh, actually said she couldn't welcome us uh, because we're already here because in their, uh, their practice was to welcome people at the gap. And I actually really took my hat off to her for actually sort of talking about the way they traditionally welcome people. Um, and so then she went on to do an acknowledgement and that actually really impacted that and then I went to collect some, had to get various permissions to get local clay and all of those conversations, uh, I suppose shared, there was no one person to ask, there were lots of people to ask and uh, the whole story of going and collecting the clay and some people saying, well, that's not the right permission and other people saying it is the right permission and the whole story was part of the work. The Triennale was focused a lot on how we, uh, work in ceramics with traditional owners given given we're dealing with the earth um and then that's, that's uh, fascinating patty we'll have to to move it along if that's oh sorry okay. i'm going on and on was i sorry that's it's fascinating sorry, I get very we've back. got a lot to get through today and i certainly okay. recommend Thank you. everyone to to read the article but also watch the video to see the process because that uh, is a very important part of it so Thank you. Oh, Brent. I apologize, Kevin. I have no That's idea. Fine. That's fine. Um, if we can go now to Anna, also I think in, in Ballarat, to tell us about your fascinating work, which also involves ceramics and weaving. Yes. Um, yeah, I haven't trained at all in ceramics. Um, so my article is about. Um, sort of the binaries of time and place, um, I guess, of past and connecting to present um, in order to sort of create a future for myself and my family. Um, so my article is about a cloth that I wove um, as a dedication to the craft of hand weaving um, and the goddess of Athena as well, um, which came about in trying to anchor some, um, trying to anchor to this time and to this place and anchor all those binary things by digging up the clay in the backyard, which is a new, I'm, I'm newly arrived here to, to Ballarat or whatever on country. I grew up in uh, Nam in Melbourne, born and bred, and my parents migrated from their home country and their parents migrated from different home country um, also of, of birth. So there's been generations of movement. And whilst mine isn't to a completely different country, it did allow me um, moving from a very urban space to a, a country space to reflect um, on that that pattern of movement and um, yeah, just to try and connect and make sense of all of that, that history for myself right now. Um, so yeah, I, at the time I was working at a commercial weaving mill um, in Geelong and I'd rescued some gorgeous Australian wool yarn um, out of the skip, which is a very large bin um, for commercial industrial waste. And I went about dyeing it, um, naturally dyeing it using dyes that would have been um, used perhaps in ancient Greece. Um, I have a Greek heritage and uh, yeah, from hand weaving this to then also um, researching um, sort of the traditional loom technology from ancient Greece um, at a time 
when uh, people, women would have been selected to weave a peplos for the goddess Athena and uh, present it to her in a procession, I realized that um, weaving, uh, that weaving has almost um, encompassed sort of rituals and um, can be quite devotional or the, the acts within it um, can be ritualistic um, and that um, in the warp weighted looms that would have been used in ancient times, excuse me, my dogs have just arrived home and they might bark in the background. Um, uh, yeah, that um, votif um, loom weights that used to tension the warp in a vertical loom, which was the technology used, um, were also used as votive offerings to the, the goddess um, in temples. So um, I, that was how I came to be digging up clay in the backyard and researching very crude sort of techniques, I guess, or very just basic techniques um, that, yeah, I, I tried to recreate these little votive uh, votive uh, loom weights and fired them in a terracotta pot um, with my partner and um, yeah and then was able to exhibit the cloth um, at a, a craft event in Ballarat which um, is also a UNESCO city of craft and there's depictions of Minerva also in Ballarat so there was a kind of synchronicity for me in this project and it felt um, it just really felt right. So that's wonderful. Yeah, that, that's what my article is about. And, and it really relates quite well to, to Sarah's work in terms of extending the loom, certainly in space, uh, and connecting it back to some of the ancient traditions. To go a little bit further back in the process, I'd like to welcome uh, Yudat Versing, who shared with us uh, his technique of meditation through spinning. Uh, namaste, welcome, Yudhavir Singh. Can you tell namaste us? Namaste to everybody. Article. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I'm just 24 years old and uh, I'm the youngest member of World Craft Council. I come from the family who has a great uh, background of craft and textiles and from the region. Uh, we come from a Kutch region of India, uh, which is in Gujarat, the state of Gujarat. And at the age of six, uh, me and my sister both are twins. So my mother was into the craft revivalist and she used to work with many of the artisans from India. So uh, I remember at the age of six was the first time when we uh, went with her on the textile uh, journey of the Indian villages. And uh, it was so amazing, like seeing craftsmen and uh, uh, printers, they were dying in the natural indigo. The man was half dipped in the natural indigo tub. And that was amazing. And uh, that's how we were exposed to textiles uh, and handcrafted process. Uh, slowly and gradually, as uh, at the age of 18, I made my first collection. And uh, the spinning, uh, spinning as a meditation, like how, how I got toward the spinning. The, I, I, I used to go to the villages and there was this weaver and his family. So in India, uh, uh, in the older days, each and every, the 70% uh, was uh, still today, they live, they live in the villages and they are farmers. So in the morning after doing their farming practice, everybody used to spin. And I have seen that in my house also. Uh, so I found spinning as a, I started at the age of 15. Uh, why, I started, why I started was uh, because uh, when I used to go to the villages, weavers, uh, uh, children used to do the same thing. So I thought, let's uh, start doing it because that's, that's a game for them, like a PSP uh, for us because we stay in the city. So I, I just observed the process of it. And uh, it was like, in the beginning, it was quite hard for me because as a person, I had a very hyper nature and uh, it made it difficult. But as slowly and gradually the time passed, I realized that this is the process where 
humans both the head like the life uh, the, le the left brain and the right brain both are equally like you are using equally because you are spinning from the right hand and you are pulling the thread from the left hand and uh, if if your thoughts goes to some other place or you, anything else so the threads would break and that's how i i i I found out like this is more than a meditation because even while meditating, even while doing yogas, you are always uh, uh, in your back of the mind. You you would be thinking, I have to meet this guy, I have to meet him, and something or the other. But in this process, if you think the thread would break, uh, it will break, and uh, that's how I discovered that this is the best way to evaluate one's. Uh, one's own self like you 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 do not have to go to some other people to tell you that this is the thing this is the place you, in which you are having a difficulties or what are the things so i thought that spinning is not only uh, spinning of threads but it is spinning of your life cycle it is spinning of your brain it is spinning of your emotion it is spinning of entire human cycle and your surrounding uh, and uh, it is so calm. It is so calm, and it is. It is. I can't define uh, because it's it's an experience which I have every day. Because uh, after uh, during the COVID, it was hard time for each and everybody. And uh, what to do? So uh, again, I got into this, and then I discovered so many ways, and uh, I have written so many journals for myself, and. Uh, how could it be useful? And well, that's, that's how uh, you, you share it with us, uh, Yudavi Singh. And uh, I believe you're going to also later share with us a more portable form of spinning using a coconut, yes. shell, which would be good. And uh, we hope yes, to because... hear future stories about uh, the Amoda Essence uh, workshop that uh, your family produced. But also, thank you so much for your work with the World Craft Council in developing a youth chapter for the next generation. Yeah. Uh, Hello. That will be terrific. Hello. Thank you so, so much. Uh, okay. If we now go to Gary. Okay. I'll just try and see who's, if you could just unmute if you're not speaking. So Gary. <coughs> Right? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Namaste. Yes, another everybody. wonderful, amazing story from Nepal. Well, I'll I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, I worked. Uh, I I turned seventy this year, and I worked for thirty years uh, in ceramics. So it was very interesting to hear each of you who have been involved with um, ceramics. Uh, so it's it was very close to my heart, and and. A few years ago, I, well, several years ago now, when I first went to Nepal, I discovered uh, where I was living in uh, Lalitpur in Patan um, that there were uh, the streets were really lined with craftsmen, and you could hear all the time. You could hear the sound of wood carving and of uh, metalwork and uh, tapping of all kinds. So, so I was just um, in a kind of craftsman's heaven. And it was through that that I decided to uh, start writing about these crafts uh, for, for several reasons. One, one reason was just my uh, curiosity and fascination with uh, the handcrafts and the very simple tools that they use, but also because um, this generation of craftspeople are dying out and their children no longer want to be um, involved in craft. They are going abroad to study and taking up different professions. So in a way, I thought it was a way of also recording something that is um, that is kind of dying out. Um, uh, Ratnamani Brahmacharya is a very sweet, very um, modest guy who has a huge skill. And um, he also knows uh, many other kinds of crafts. And this is another thing that I find quite extraordinary in Nepal is that if a craftsman is working in metal, they usually have also worked in wood or in um, uh, uh, metal, uh, almost any other craft they have tried. And then they have 
gradually kind of come to the to to follow the family tradition and Ratnamani Brahmacharya comes from a wood carving tradition. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's always, it, it was astonishing to me. I haven't seen him actually since COVID. Unfortunately, um, I came back from Nepal about six weeks ago to Finland. Um, they still have um, quite a lot of COVID going on and they have a new epidemic or yeah, kind of epidemic of uh, dengue fever. And so there are quite a lot of health issues that people deal with. And for that reason, you can't always go and visit people at their studios because they're kind of afraid of, of losing their professions, of course. And, um, but in, in Ratnamani, he had two, two places, one in the center of town or in the center of Patan, um, where he would go at least once a day and work and visit um, and, and be visited by customers. And then the other is this, uh, for example, this is a picture of the family eating at, at his home um, outside, outside of the city uh, where he spends most of his time and he employs um, several craftsmen. The absolutely wonderful thing that I think about these uh, people when, when you look at the complexity of the sculpture, um, they go into the wood uh, with no drawing really they'll scratch out a little bit of something with a ballpoint pen on the wood but then they just start to, to carve and the whole thing is is in their head so they they have a phenomenal kind of mental image of a three-dimensional image in their head of, of how this works and um, I have spent many hours with these uh, families with these different wood carvers in the city and um, I'm just um, astonished. Ratnamani also, um, this is a shot taken after the earthquake. He also is very involved in uh, community affairs and um, supporting other, other craftsmen and other people. And there's a short video here. So um, this is kind of early days for me making videos. There's no, um, there's a short kind of interviews, which I was lucky enough to have translated by friends here Nepali friends here in Finland. So there's a short video there, three or four minutes, which will give you some a little bit deeper insight into, into his work. Well, thank you so I'll just, much, Gary. Uh, just finish, I'll just finish by saying that I've now been asked because um, mm -hmm. one of the things I've been doing in Finland is um, working with the um, health services here. I'm working in Kyrgyzstan and Cambodia and, uh, and um, various places in Africa. Ethiopia training people to make uh, to record <clears throat> to record their um, traditions, and I've been asked now to go to the far west of Nepal um, to Rukum uh, to record the uh, uh, to to teach these local people to make uh, documentary videos or to or or, or to to create our archival material using their phones to preserve the traditions of their crafts and their um, various um, various customs. So when I go back to Nepal uh, next week, after the Dashain holiday, I will be heading out to the far west to teach these people to do it themselves rather than having foreigners come in and do it for them. That's it. That's wonderful, Gary. And uh, I really commend everyone to, to, to Gary's articles. They do certainly, help you understand life on the ground in places like Kathmandu and at a time when our travel is very restricted. Uh, it's a great, uh, it's very exciting to be able to offer this and it's very impressive the, the life of the craftsperson, the dedication that is revealed through your stories. So thanks very much. Now, if we can go to Greg Pryor. This is a very different kind of article for Garland. This is uh, about a sculptor but one that relates so well to the, the theme of, of cutting. Greetings, Greg. Uh, yes, am I unmuted? You're unmuted. Okay, all right. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks so much for the opportunity to contribute. And 
Uh, thank you to all the contributors. I feel rather overwhelmed to be in your company. I've enjoyed all your articles. And it's not only the issue I'm sharing with you, you've all come together on my birthday. So I, I think it's a really nice way to um, uh, celebrate it. And uh, Kevin, I will have to excuse myself afterwards because my family's waiting for me. So um, uh, I just squeezed it in in time. So yeah, it was great to be able to put this article together about uh, a dear friend who I, I studied uh, art school with, Victor Meertens, and it's in a way a gesture of thanks. I learned a lot from Victor. And the emphasis in the article is how Victor introduced me to the language of offcuts, of discarded material, mainly um, industrial sort of man-made materials in an urban setting. So as art students, we used to travel around. What you're seeing here is some of the work, early work he did with corrugated iron that he, uh, uh, so had we say, exchanged for um, uh, slabs of beer and alcohol on demolition sites to make his work. And uh, what impressed me uh, when, when this opportunity to contribute to the cutting and joining issue came up, uh, I just thought of Victor immediately because it's a complex language to engage with discarded material. Uh, Gary, just looking at your uh, shots from the wood carving workshops and all the, the wood, the camp for wood gathering up in the crevices and everything. And, and you know, Victor really brought my attention to these uh, parts that are mm -hmm. some often overlooked in industrial skips and whatever. And uh, you can see here, uh, a, a sort of a experimental musical performance where Victor later translated his material of repurposing and refashioning found objects into bread as a primary uh, sort of creative medium. So it was when he worked with bread, it was really like he he was a virtuoso at finding elasticity in the most sort of unusual places and the alchemical properties of bread, uh, bringing the water and the flour together, the yeast, the rising, the transformation was very much implicit in his found object work also. So he's also known quite strongly as an experimental musician. And I think one of the key sort of uh, discovery for me of really drilling into Victor's work was the patina and the sort of um, the damage, the marks that often are acquired by discarded industrial materials. I realized that as an experimental musician, it was this sort of almost these markings created a direct link to the atonal noises and um, um, you know, sounds that were a feature of Victor's um, experimental music performances. So this photo here is of a, a, a colleague uh, in Romania holding one of Victor's found object improvised musical instruments called a long wire. And uh, one of the points I make here is that um, Victor wasn't ever, hasn't ever been really that interested in bringing these performances into uh, a gallery situation early on, yes, but uh, often the bread making and the music performance are often uh, in, how do we say, marginalized spaces, impromptu spaces. And uh, you can see here a great shot of more recent work uh, where he turned to working with um, acoustic felt panels. And I think this is an excellent shot that just shows, you know, this language of the offcuts really strongly. And I think one point I make in the article is I think a very important skill to have in a maker is making um, 
making sense, making meaning from the offcuts of offcuts of offcuts of offcuts. Off off <laughs> so as the the material language is being diminished, it sort of implies the development of an increasingly refined language of making, if you like. So it was a great opportunity to explore, uh, you know, not just the material language of offcuts, but some of the conceptual um, resonances that are uh, embedded in Victor's work. Well, thanks. That's fascinating, Greg. I think I can hear the candles being lit next door for your birthday. So we should let you go. <laughs> uh, uh, I think there's great resonance with with Gary's, and since you're both kind of story keepers, you've got a story that of somebody else that you're trying to do justice to and putting it into Garland hopefully is a way in which it can not only get a readership now, but also uh, have a, a history over time. And that's part of the purpose of the Garden of Stories for people to discover this wonderful world of offcuts. Thanks so much, Greg, and enjoy yeah, thanks, the rest Evan. of your day and year. If we can go next to Pamela C. Um, thank you, Kevin. I'm, um, I'd just like to first, I, I just uh, like to acknowledge the Yagur and Turbul uh, people, um, the land of which I'm speaking, the elders past, present and emerging. Um, as you mentioned, the article is about Deborah Kelly and I'm, I feel greatly privileged to be able to share her project um, called Creation with you. Um, she uses a participatory art uh, framework and uh, engages a diversity of craftspeople and traditions, some of the dating back, some of the media dating back to ancient times um, to, in this case, critique uh, the cultural climate. And the exhibition um, the, that I, I focused on in, in what, what essentially is a review uh, was staged during the federal election earlier in the year. Um, in Brisbane, in the Griffith, uh, Griffith University, uh, Univ Griffith, uh, yeah, Griffith University Art Museum. Um, and uh, I thought it really uh, epitomized, um, you know, this, this sense of the sense of change. Um, this, she, what she did was proposition a, a new religion um, and uh, she was critiquing the government's, the former government's stance on climate change denial, private ownership and gender binaries. Uh, and she did this through, um, well, basically she, she starts always with collage uh, and then um, she, she uh, collaborates with a number of different um, specialists uh, in, in crafts people in different medium. Um, and uh, in some cases that, uh, the output has quite a level of material and technical finery. Um, and more often than not, these objects are also, uh, they're, they're utilitarian in that they're very beautiful and refined, but then um, they, they're they used in, in performance such as uh, you can see her choir. Uh, probably the highlight I think for of the exhibition for me is this regala, um, which uh, they, um, are, are mm. costumes, I guess, that that represent different religious figures um, in the ideology that she created. Uh, so there's the bacteria, the serpent, uh, the vulture, infinity, and the moon um, represented here. And, and, and the way that they were suspended in a room was as though they were inviting people to come and participate and also put them on, um, in a sense. And earlier you saw a shot of another uh, key artwork, um, which were, which was the banners, the profession banners, um, and so uh, they too were also uh, workshopped and then used. Um, uh, there was a lot of beading uh, of pearls and also painting and, and hand embroidery, and I guess that uh, although that she works, um, she's sort of interested in in non uh, gender binaries. Uh, there's a throwback to Judy Chicago's work uh, in the dinner table from the 1970s as well. So uh, Kelly, she grew up in the 1960s uh, and was educated um, by Catholic nuns. Uh, hence, I think the focus on, on, on uh, for her creating a new religion. But at that time, uh, there was a, uh, what became, what rose to prominence to say, had salience was both decoupage, 
uh, and counterculture. So in England, um, what became popular was sort of like uh, the Meg Mog series, Witchcraft became mainstream, for instance. Um, and what I found really interesting about collage, uh, decoupage, is that it was a means uh, not only of, in, in, of um, individual introspection, but um, in a way, a resistance to the burgeoning, um, well, it was the sort of mass media and mass consumerism that came with it. So people could individualize their craft products and they didn't need a lot of skill. And I think that a real takeaway that I, I found, because many of you might know, as so I researched paper cutting, um, was through through uh, Kelly's really very sophisticated, um, yet, yet simply uh, and, and beautifully executed uh, work, um, was a connection to a very ancient um, uh, uh, craft and religious uh, practice of a people called the Scythians. Um, and uh, they actually transversed uh, an area between Eastern Europe and, and Asia. Um, and they had blue eyes and fair skin. Um, and yet uh, uh, their, their, their descendants uh, ended up in uh, Xinjiang in Northwest China, which is actually where the first uh, paper cut, I'm sorry, the oldest paper cut in existence was unearthed. Wow. And that dates back to the sixth century. Um, but uh, prior to that, uh, what has been found are uh, older examples created by the same tribes uh, in Siberia and um, same technique, uh, but they're actually cut out of felt. And uh, so, so this sort of, for my research, challenges the origin of the craft in itself, and it probably would be, I don't sure yeah. the Chinese would like that very much. Well, Pamela, um, thank, but thank it's just... you. Sorry, thank you. Thank you yeah. so much for 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 that, which I think certain, certainly, certainly we should all read it very carefully because it's an extraordinary learning when you were, you have been a thinker maker as part of this series and it's very evident in your article. And uh, I think it uh, relates quite well to the other uh, offcuts and so on that we've heard from today and perhaps anticipates Patrick Webb's reference as well to some ancient cultures. So thank you so much. Sorry to, to finish you off, uh, Pamela. And if we can go next, to Miranda, also in Mianjin. Greetings, Miranda. Hello. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's so lovely to hear from everybody about their stories and how different um, the approaches have been to, to the topic. Um, I had the pleasure of writing about Ali McKay's work. So, um, Ali McKay is a artist and poet um, and educator based here in Mianjin, Brisbane. And we have known each other for several years, actually, since we were at art school together and have followed each other's practice. And um, I have kind of written this article about her most recent exhibition, which was a series of um, beautiful installations, um, a mixture of paper and wood and acrylic installations um, that were really a reflection on her personal experience of the pandemic, but also very much related to a collective experience as well, particularly in relation to um, changing rules and systems, um, which Ali's work has always focused on. So I say in the article, like in some ways, it feels like Ali has always been creating work about this pandemic experience almost. And this exhibition was really um, a kind of a fulfillment of that. So she's um, really working through and kind of processing her experiences through paper cutting and embossing and the repetition of certain words like essential um, which we heard kind of over and over and over again um, during that time. Um, but Ali is here, so it would make a lot more sense for her to speak to her own practice, I think, than me going on about it. So, um, Ali, do you want to um, start? I think you maybe? speak really well about it, Miranda. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely on the right kind of wavelength there. 
Um, I have really worked a bit more with laser cutting for this exhibition, which is something new to my practice and something I have kind of um, been looking more into um, as a way to really play with the shadow, um, which has become a medium that I'm really interested in exploring and as like an immaterial material to kind of manipulate and echo this sense of doubt. Um, so that aspect of cutting um, is quite a new part of my practice in a way, but I've also been thinking about it for a really long time and having access to this um, laser cutter and working through technology in different ways has enabled me to kind of change mediums and work with acrylic. And it's helping me to think in um, different sculptural realms because I really do like working with shadow and installation based works. So yeah, with this body of work being responding to the pandemic and just trying to work with phrases that we've heard over and over again. And um, like my greatest fear is to um, be caught in a loop and working with how that those feelings of being stuck and not going anywhere, but as a friendly reassurance, but also of um, feeling a bit stuck and not being able to, to leave. Um, so I guess that's kind of where I sit. Thanks, helps. thanks so much, um, Ali and Miranda, for for sharing that. And I think it'd be obviously an interesting dialogue with uh, Pamela as well, who's been looking at the technologies of cutting and and what they they mean. It seems a very rich area at the moment. And so, thank you so much. If we can go now to Nanu in Bangkok, uh, where we combine cutting and joining with some amazing work, sculptural work called the 12 Camels. Welcome. Mm. Hi, hi everyone. Um, hope all is good. Um, yeah, cutting and joining. Um, maybe I could start by um, uh, explaining what I do first, because um, maybe we'll help the story go along better. Um, I'm, a, I'm a maker, but, um, I have a, but I have a design um, education background. So, Part of what I do is um, um, it's to uh, organize this um, ex yearly exhibition because I am a, I'm a co coordinator of a, a platform called Grains and Grams. It's um, it's a collective of makers, tie makers that has passion in woods um, mainly by start, but now we start to extend the big family by actually by um, organizing yearly exhibitions together. Um, so this is part of Bangkok Design Week exhibition. Um, this year, Bangkok Design Week, I have, um, I've, sorry, hangover, I must be, uh, truth be told. <laughs> the, the um, I have been, coming from Bangkok, I, um, I was inspired by, um, by the street furnishes. Um, some might call it, um, bars or chairs or whatever. These are things that people put together um, by chance um, from found objects, from whatever it is. So these are like um, people that are um, kind of like, I wouldn't call it marginalized, but they, they live uh, by what they found and then they put together necessary things together just, just to make the life functions. So, you know, having, um, having been studying abroad for a long time, one thing that I noticed that, uh, you know, as designers, we all have a choice um, and it's become like a luxury of a choice um, because we're able to pick and use things that we like. We know how to combine things. We know how to make things look nice. And, you know, um, some time for um, commercialized, um, you know, purpose or sometimes for, for, uh, for other reasons. But, you know, and, and for this exhibition, um, there is a design narrative that's going on in, in, in the usual design um, design week context. Is that like usually things that you'd see in the design weeks are like um, um, you know design as profession. These things are being designed by professional designers. So these are like you know what I just mentioned before. These are things that are being designed to sell or to entice you. But I want to propose um, another narrative, which is design as human activities, because. You know, this is what we do um, as humans is to make things and to design things. Quite often, frankly, problem solving, um, and that's the most basic activities that we do. But, um, you know, this narrative is being very um, 
um, how do you say, underappreciated. So I kind of want to bring it, you know, bring it forward. So as a coordinator of, of, of uh, this uh, collective, I've sort of designed uh, this activity or this, you call it uh, this exhibition to like mix things up a little bit. So we basically ask a group of um, uh, participants, usually mostly my friends, and we're kind of extending it uh, later on. So we, we ask them to join us and, you know, we are removing choice, but then replace it with chance in the sense that I ask each um, participant to to make a three-legged stool, like you know, the most basic, um, the most basic furniture there is, three-legged stool, only four parts together. So I asked them to to look around for for three pieces of legs and uh, and a seat. It can be found, it can be made, it can be you can cut it from somewhere else, take it out from the trash. You could, um, yeah, whatever you find in your household. And I specifically asked them not to consider how they're coming together like it's no point because at the end they're gonna we're gonna pile it up and we're gonna randomize it so as we randomize it i remove myself from um i remove myself from this process of randomizing and i trust the god of artificial intelligence to do it for me so i put it in the randomizer on a computer and these are then being reassigned back to each person um so you would end up having a new packages without knowing where it's from uh, or yeah, or who chose it for you. But now you have a new task of putting things together. So in a sense, this is like, you know, your, your, your profession being removed, just your, just you as a human being trying to solve this problem in front of you. And then, and the result has been amazing actually, because um, you, you get to see this, um, this amazing, this because we, you know, we invited like frontline designers, frontline, you know, artists, and, and uh, for some part of the, <laughs> for some part of the process, they're actually calling me, like you know, express their fear of like how it doesn't work, and, like they're just afraid of maybe how it wouldn't work out. But at the end, they they all like jump through it and break through, and they produce everyone produce something pretty amazing and interesting. And right. Thank, thank you. Operate so somewhere much. new. Yes. Thank you so yeah. much, Leonard, and. Uh, for giving us a very fresh perspective on what's what's happening in Bangkok, but also, as you say, that yeah. that sense of humanism that underlies it, that uh, is mm. something incredibly valuable. And uh, we hope to hear more from uh, <clears throat> Grams and Grains in the future. Thank you so much. And if we can go no next, problem. I think it's to Julie Bartholomew uh, for a very yes, interesting, beautiful series. Uh, related to to bees. Here we are. Gorgeous. Thank you. Uh, this project is called Habitat and it started as a response to the Black Summer fires. I was in Gujarat in the Kutch region during the fires. And when I landed back home in the middle of this devastating uh, inferno, I was absolutely um, taken back by the devastation and also uh, interested to note that there was a lot of discussion about the loss of, te the terrible loss of human life and homes and uh, land and animals, but very little was being said about the billions of insects that were destroyed, and particularly the bees. And of course, this is because, you know, we don't tune into the microscopic world as, um, you know, we're such a visually oriented society. Something so small and minuscule doesn't come into our focus. Uh, as readily. So I just felt that we needed, that I needed to uh, respond to, to the situation by creating um, homes or hives for bees that were different to the usual box-like um, human built environment oriented structure. And uh, instead 
they drew attention to the uniqueness of bees and their natural environment. So like, like this is a project that that's clay because I'm a clay artist. I've also worked with glass. But, you know, it's all about taking a bag of clay, cutting it and ripping it apart and then making coils and slabs or and whatever and then reconnecting the material to create an object that, that has an intent. And, and the intent of this project and these objects is to make connections um, that are not usual, uh, you know, connections between or across different fields. For instance, this is a sculptural project. It's not about the traditional vessel form, though it is a vessel and it does draw from traditional elements of ceramics. But it's a sculptural form inspired by the natural honeycombing and the ovoid uh, forms that are created in the wild, that you, you know, the hives that are seen that um, cascade down from branches and these extraordinary shapes really inspired me as far as the forms concerned. <clears throat> it's also a design project that um, needed to consider utility and functionality. The bees need to be able to live in these structures. So <clears throat> I, I, I sought the advice of experts in the field um, and I needed to consider you know, the size of the entrance, the material itself, was it an appropriate insulator? Um, how to keep it waterproof? What size did it need to be? And all of these aspects are about design <clears throat> and an object becoming um, a functional living working um, structure for living creatures. But it's also an environmental project designed to bring greater awareness to the global decline of bees, um, locally and um, internationally. So mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a project that's about ripping and cutting and dissecting clay and rebuilding and reconnecting not only the object itself, but across many um, diverse disciplines. And, thank, thank you um, so much, uh, Julie. That's and pretty much a a summary of the project yes. and very the article. Well, very well done. And it does, in a sense, also show how uh, these works can respond to some of the, the major disruptions we've experienced, uh, whether it's uh, mm. COVID or, in, in your case, the uh, the bushfires that, that can lead to a creative mm. response. Now, five, uh, we should get on. We've got a couple more left, particularly Patrick Webb. I'm very pleased and grateful Patrick, for you staying up so, or getting up so early, I should say, uh, in in the US for uh, uh, an article that takes from your very excellent blog, which covers uh, in very interesting detail uh, some of the mythologies attached to to crafts. Would you like to to speak briefly to to your project and and your perspective and why you are drawn as a plasterer to to this? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm very much a, a working craftsman. Um, I come from an English arts and crafts um, background. Um, and so I was trained as a, formerly as a um, stone carver in the English cathedral system. And um, following my father, um, I worked more as a heritage and ornamental plaster. And, uh, but another interest of mine um, has been on the philosophical um, project of the arts and crafts movement um, that in some respects was abandoned after the wars. And um, so I pick up and write about um, a lot of concerning the, you know, the underlying philosophy that was particularly being explored in the 19th century. Um, but before, you know, man became, you know, philosophically so self-reflective and, you know, in a very explicit and very rational way, um, you know, that I would say that the first thing we really did was more tell, you know, s stories about the things that we were doing, the things that we were acting out. And so um, that's what this particular article speaks to. Um, it's, it's, talking about um, essentially the, the myths of, of creation, the, the myths of, 
of how things come, came to came to be. And um, you know, for the Egyptians, they held um, a view that everything was ex deo; everything actually came out of um, the divine itself. So the divine is constantly renewing and constantly remaking itself. And uh, that's probably very much akin to like the Taoist perspective. Um, the, the universe is unfolding in a way that's of itself so. Everything is divine and full of wonder. Um, with the Greeks, you have a perspective that is perhaps more ex materia. So um, that being um, things are made out of essentially matter or mother. And so what you have is the divine element um, mixing with the chaotic element and these things two coming together, pater and mater, pattern and, and matter, you know, father and mother coming together to breed natura, you know, nature, something, something that's born. And then what's alluded to in the articles, but um, is not part of it is the, the kind of, of um, I would say, the perspective that dominates the Western thinking ex nihilo that's coming from the Judaic tradition, tradition and it's part of the three Western religions, Judaism, um, Islam, and um, Christianity, that um, nature is something of a fashioned object. Um, it's an artifact in the world, something that's made, something actually that's quite separate from, from the, from the design, divine. So, um, but I would just say, generally speaking, um, my project is one of um, a philosophical reflection of, um, of, um, of doing and making it. As much as we can talk about it in language, I, I think as um, the gentleman from India was explaining, you know, the greatest meditation is, is really doing. And in a sense, you know, um, you know, as opposed to purposeful meditation, it, it's kind of a Cohen. It's like, it's almost impossible to do, to, to free your mind just by trying to sit down and be quiet. But when you're actually engaged, you're, you're physically absorbed, you, you lose your mind, you actually lose yourself in the craft. And, and um, that certainly is my experience. And then a little bit that we can talk about it or share about it, um, I'm trying to put down in, in words. Um, I have a philosophical project that's more public right now, but I also have a poetic one that I think um, actually is trying to reach at the very limits of language to, to approach what we, you know, all as craftspeople um, experience. Well, thank you and so much. I'll defer the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, and we hope to hear a lot more of you because it seems you've got a very interesting, certainly in terms of being a thinker maker, an interesting way of working through some of these ideas that perhaps is a lot more hands-on than you might get, say, within an academic context. and. I think what you're doing provides a very valuable form of translation between ideas and things that uh, we could learn a lot from, perhaps like a, a podcast or something like that in the future would be be very good. But uh, And thank you so much for, for interrupting your night for, for us. And finally, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome back uh, Songul uh, from Turkey uh to talk about uh, her project uh her article about a puppeteer sevket who i think might be with us as well is that right yes uh, hi kai hi kai uh, first of all uh, congratulations to my dear teacher karen uh, and uh, dear garland team it is uh, a great thing uh, every issue for those reading the story, I should spend more time to share it. I uh, attending from Malatya, attending from Malatya, uh, from the east uh, to Turkey, Turkey, uh, and in the capital Ankara, uh, my teacher Laila and the hero of this story share uh, The number of puppeters in our country is decre uh, decreasing day by day. The details of Sherkat's puppet story uh, are deep. Uh, we focused on uh, the present and we cooperated. I supported him uh, with the text of the story uh, and my uh, teacher Lali inv invited him to affiliated courses in the University uh, Hacı Bayram Veli in Ankara. 
uh, while the uh, time and memories deeply affect our means, writing is of course a, a tributary for those who uh, love to read. Uh, let's say hello to Lale uh, now and then uh, Sherkat Garland said that uh, he will leave uh, a visual memory with a mini show uh, and so uh, thank you. Uh, and Lale, Lale. Hi. Hi. Sorry, there's a, an echo in the, the line with Lale. Uh -huh. But uh, we look forward to, to sharing Lale's story a little later once we've sorted out the, the images. That's a very interesting uh, story that she yes. has. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, I know. I spent uh, 20 days very busy and with uh, same illnesses. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a classes uh, at the Faculty of uh, Art and Craft uh, started yesterday. We are happy. We have puppet techniques lessons. We share market and courses content together, Shevket. We are holding an exhibition at the end of semester and doing shows, Shevket, as well. The students are having very exciting time. Maybe one day we can repeat this exhibition in Australia, maybe in other countries. Mm -hmm. If we are invented, we are attending from university. We work at the faculty. Uh, we have a um, puppet, puppet. Uh, puppet classes, and uh, now uh, she's an assistant. Mihrinas, uh, <laughs> we are attending together because uh, we have a faculty now. Uh, she is uh, assistant and she is research uh, assistant. Mm -hmm. uh, she is doctorate and um, about hat and ornament, opera and ballet. Okay, thank you so now, much, Lala, and uh, I certainly uh, recommend you also you. look at uh, some of Songul's uh, other articles. Uh, uh, on one minute, Shavkat. Shavkat. Uh, Shavkat. 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 And uh, Sevket, uh, uh, we salute you uh -huh. for your for your work. Shavkat is much, tamam. My name is Shavkat. I've been meeting Peter for 17 years. Mm -hmm. uh, this is my workshop. This wow, mm -hmm. puppet workshop. Mm -hmm. This present now, puppet workshop. Mm -hmm. Your brother, hello, mm -hmm. how are you? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege of uh, entering your workshop, Sevket. And uh, that brings us to the mm -hmm. to the end of uh, our wonderful wrap up. Uh, if you'd like just to have a, a screenshot so that we can have a little record if you're on, uh, if your camera's out, if you'd like to turn that back on, we can uh, have a screenshot and I'll just uh, pause the recording. So thank you so much.